Great, thank you uh, very much. Um, <clears throat> so welcome to panel three of the ROK US Strategic Forum 2021, um, hosted by the Korea Foundation and CSIS. Uh, this panel is about trilateralism in the US ROK Alliance in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, time is quite short, um, so I suggest that we dive right into the conversation with our <coughs> panelists, who are um, starting from my left, Professor Kim Hyunuk who's Professor and Director General at the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. Uh, sitting next to him is Alex Wong. Alex Wong is the former Deputy Assistant Secretary for North Korea 
in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs and former Deputy Special Representative for North Korea at the Department, at the Department of State. But he also had within his portfolio before you took on North Korea regional affairs, as I remember. So, so thanks very much for joining us. Um, uh, I don't see Andrew Yo yet on the screen. Um, uh, there's Andrew. So uh, Andrew Yo is joining us, I believe, from the Philippines, I think, from Manila. Yes. Um, and uh, as, as, as many of you know, uh, Andrew is professor and Director of Asian Studies at Catholic University, and he is the new SK Korea Foundation Brookings Chair, Brookings Chair at the Brookings Institution. So we're very happy to welcome Andrew with us. And a special welcome to Professor Kim Ji Young from Hanyang University. I think this is your first time to visit with us at CSIS, so we're very happy to have you join us. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, <clears throat> the title of the panel is about trilateralism, um, but I, I, I take that generally to mean more broadly um, the different multilaterals and minilaterals and quads and other geometric shapes that diplomacy and strategy are taking in the region, in the Indo-Pacific region uh, these days. Um, now, we're going to try to get through four rounds of questioning, so I'm going to ask our panelists to try to be concise in terms of their responses so that um, we can um, uh, have, a, have a good, uh, thorough discussion. Um, so for the first round of questions, I would like to ask our South Korean participants to offer their thoughts on Korea's interest um, in these new multilateral groupings. Um, you know, everything from the new so Southern diplomacy focus on ASEAN states, the Northern diplomacy, um, uh, um, uh, U.S.-Korea trilateral relations with Australia. There are many of these groupings. I just was curious as to, while this has not been, an, this sort of multilateral interaction has not been new for Korea on the global stage, there is more enthusiasm on the regional stage in terms of these. And I wanted to get at least an initial broad uh, stroke view uh, about what you think about this uh, new apparent enthusiasm for some of these multilateral groupings. So, uh, Professor Kim, why don't I start with you? No. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Victor, for, uh, for chairing this session, and uh, I'm happy that I'm a member of, uh, you know, participating in this uh, nice and uh, important uh, meeting. Uh, yes, I think South Korea has been very active in um, regional grouping, too, not only uh, global grouping. Um, I think before, uh, like the 1990s and all in 2000s, it was pretty much based upon, you know, adding into and participating into ASEAN-based uh, regional institutions like ASEAN Plus Three, uh, ASEAN Regional Forum, East Asia Summit, things like that. And I think uh, it was from the Park Geun-hye government and also Moon Jae-in government too that South Korea began to take some initiative about, uh, you know, being more active in, in forming a Northeast Asia peace uh, like a Northeast Asia Peace and uh, Cooperation Initiatives, all platforms, which has some dif different names by governments. Um, so I think this was some kinds of initiative to be more, uh, take more active uh, initiative in, in, in regional groupings. Um, but I think these efforts has not been very successful because several reasons may be because uh, the linkage between the Korean Peninsula issues and the regional uh, peace initiative has been not very much linked. Um, you know, whenever there was some uh, failure of dialogue and provocations by North Korea, uh, this, um, you know, initiatives, peace and cooperation initi initiatives in Northeast Asia has not been very successful. And second reason I think is, um, you know, it, it has been the centerpiece of the security uh, and, and, and peace uh, you know, groupings in, in, the, in this region, Northeast Asia region has been pretty much based upon, you know, alliance, bilateral alliance systems rather than, you know, multila multilateral multinational groupings. Um, so more focus has been always on the U.S.-South Korea alliance and U.S.-Japan alliances, uh, which has been not very much, you know, uh, in a positive, um, you know, synergy between alliance systems on one hand and the other um, the uh, you know Northeast Asia multilateral groupings. 
Uh, last region, I think, is pretty much you know, related to the U.S.-China competition. Um, nowadays, as uh, you know, Kurt Campbell mentioned, CPTPP, for example, and Quad, many of the regional uh, you know, groupings have some features of uh, you know, uh, you know, U.S. initiatives or Chinese initiatives, which makes uh, South Korea a you know, hard time to determine whether it should be participating or not. Um, CPTPP, uh, when the U.S. took initiative, South Korea was very hesitant, and now China is taking initiative, and again, uh, I don't think South Korea will be successfully participating in CPTPP. So uh, I'm not sure what's going to be the future. Maybe you'll ask us several other questions, and I can answer those questions, but that's pretty much what I'm thinking. Great. Thank you, Professor. Professor uh, Kim, would you like to add any comments about Korea's interest in these multilaterals? multilateralism has actually continued since 1990s, you know, especially after 1997 financial crisis. You know, at that time, um, Kim Dae-jung administration realized, you know, um, the importance of reaching out to more broadly to East and Southeast Asia, especially. So, as uh, Dr. Kim mentioned, you know, uh, the Korean government start to focusing on. Um, this ASEAN plus three uh, meetings and FTA, both multilateral and bilateral. And also, you know, recently we uh, saw the... Uh, yeah, recently uh, we <coughs> saw the successful conclusion of our uh, CEF and etc. Uh, each administration actually, uh, since then, the Kim Dae-jung administration, um, came up with uh, various very ambitious plans for uh, regional cooperation. Uh, but I, I believe um, they were relatively weak in detail and also practical strategy. And especially the problem is that, you know, those plans of past have been um, actually um, have been self-centered in that they are projected uh, for usually uh, to support, to gain support for each government North Korean policy and sometimes overly focus on economic interest. But now I believe South Korean uh, government is trying to shed uh, this image and by emphasizing this, um, the mutual prosperity over national interest, you know, with uh, regional members, especially Southeast Asian uh, countries in uh, India. Uh, so I think this transition to community partnership is one of the most important change um, in Korea's engagement in multilateral cooperation at this time. Great, thank you so much. Um, for our uh, American participants, I was wondering if I could ask you to comment on the Biden administration's coalitional diplomacy broadly um, and whether you think it's been effective. I mean, Dr. Campbell, when he was here, talked quite a bit about um, this, uh, and, and Professor Lee's, President Lee's question about the multilateralization of the alliance network. So, I would just be curious to get your thoughts on how, um, um, how, how successful you think this is and whether it's the right direction. So, perhaps I could start with uh, Alex Wong. Sure. Thank, thanks, Victor. <clears throat> you know, I think 11 months in, to the, the Biden administration, there are kind of two ways to look at this. Number one, looking at the kind of new multilateral frameworks or, or at least the concepts of how regional cooperation will, will, will work from an architecture standpoint, it's been pretty good. You know, you look at the Quad, I think the continued commitment to the Quad, a continuation of what the, the Trump administration tried to do and prior administrations tried to do with the Quad is a good thing. That's a good concept. That's a good arch, piece of architecture. I think AUKUS makes uh, immense amount of sense, so much so that I'm surprised that this idea didn't come around earlier than, than this year. <clears throat> I think the start of, uh, or at least the beginning of, of this administration's commitment to, to the ASEAN framework 
with uh, President Biden showing up, at least to the virtual summit, is a good start. Many administrations have a good start, and hopefully it continues. So, so looking at the architecture and the concepts, I think these are all good. But the second piece is the substance. What are the, the projects, the cooperative uh, substance that we're going to try to institutionalize through these, these, uh, these, these, these concepts, these, these architectures? And that's an open question. I think there's been a lot of good talk from uh, some members of the administration on this. Uh, but the questions are, will there be concrete actions and, and coordination on uh, deterrence and defense frameworks among, among these partners <clears throat> for a number of contingencies, including Taiwan? You have to ask, are there going to be concrete actions and steps and, and mechanisms for protecting critical uh, technologies, supply chains, critical infrastructure? And there's, are there going to be concrete steps in these, these frameworks to embed all of the partners in a web of commerce and a web of uh, defense coordination uh, that will secure a, 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 a truly free and, un, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy or Indo-Pacific? Now, these are all hard and big tasks. They're going to take a number of years, if not decades. But the jury is out on, on whether we can, can use these, these concepts to, to, to do the work there. And a big question there is, will the Biden administration focus laser-like on that project? Or will they be distracted by other priorities, whether foreign or domestic, in pursuit of that over the next three years, and if there's a second term, a second term? Right, thanks, Alex. Uh, Andrew Yeo in Manila. Um, yes. You are, you are uh, joining us, I think, uh, quite late at night or early in the morning. <laughs> Yes, but I'm in solidarity with our Korean participants for a jet lag. Um, it's almost <laughs> 3 a.m. here. Um, th thanks, Victor. Um, as you know, I'll just uh, you know add that since the early days of his campaign, President Biden has repeatedly stated strong support for U.S. alliances and multilateral institutions, and the president, as well as several of his top foreign policy advisors, have also been proponents of liberal internationalism, a perspective on global politics that advocates global engagement by strengthening the rules, norms, and institutions that sustain a free and open international order. Now, the administration's adoption of liberal internationalism is relevant to our conversation about coalitional diplomacy as the overarching objective of diplomatic and security coalitions is to sustain and promote a rules-based order. Now, some may argue that the key objective of coalition diplomacy as manifest in groupings like the Quad or AUKUS is to defend states against Chinese aggression. That may be one objective. However, the Biden administration has been working hard to avoid that impression. The key, I think, for U.S. policymakers is to continue framing the Quad and other trilaterals and strategic partnerships as promoting regional governance and shared principles. Groupings like the Quad and trilateral should stand for something and not just in opposition to one country. And that's why I think we've seen an emphasis on issues like vaccine distribution, cybersecurity, and infrastructure governance, which is in theory something that China could participate in as well, at least when we're talking about the Quad. I think smaller countries will still interpret U.S.-led coalitions as being primed to counter Chinese regional efforts. And I think there are some issues such as standards, uh, standards or um, emerging technologies where it might be hard not to come down on a particular side. But as Secretary of State Blinken's now well-quoted line uh, refers to, our relationship with China will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. And that, I think, reflects how the administration has also approached existing and new U.S.-led coalitions. Now, I do think it's a little bit too early to say whether the Biden administration has succeeded, and we're still waiting for the full details of the Indo-Pacific strategy. But as um, Alex mentioned, I think in the first 11 months, we've seen uh, a lot of attention, at least given to coalitional diplomacy and these new uh, different configurations, groupings, and institutions within Asia's regional architecture. Great, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so for our second round of questioning, I'd like to dig a little deeper uh, now that we've sort of taken the, 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 the sort of top layer off. And um, for Korean participants, I wanted to ask you your views on We've talked about a number of these uh, different coalitional efforts. I'd like to ask your views on which of these multilateral initiatives you feel have the most promise from a Korean perspective. Which of these, you know, whether they're in Southeast Asia or Central Asia or in Oceania, 
or in, in Northeast Asia, which of these to you uh, seem to show the most promise from a Korean perspective? And then the same question for the United States, but I guess the question for the US participants is from a US perspective, in terms of the objectives in the Indo-Pacific, uh, which of these groupings um, do you feel that the United States thinks it's important to, for Korea to be a part of? Um, and so let me go in reverse order and start with, uh, with Andrew, if I could. So Andrew in the Philippines. Sure, thanks. So uh, in terms of which multilateral groupings are important, especially for Korea, I mean, the two that we've been, uh, that we're focused on here today is the Quad and maybe the US, Japan, Korea uh, trilateral uh, relationship. And, you know, as for the Quad, you know, it's been given special attention the, in this first year of the Biden administration with, you know, Biden holding both a virtual meeting of the Quad leaders in March and then an in-person summit in September. And that's one of the areas where we've actually seen continuity from the Trump to Biden administration. Although I'd say we've seen, we've seen the shift away from defense, uh, defense security emphasis on the quad to a wider range of issues, uh, non-traditional security and economic issues, uh, such as you know, vaccine partnerships, health security, you know, infrastructure coordination groups, and climate change. And for these reasons, I think that's why uh, it's important to Korea. You know, it's not just about security and defense. And we know that uh, we've heard from a, a vice foreign minister that you know uh, South Korea wants to maintain positive relations with Beijing and Washington. Um, so you don't necessarily have, you know, when you when you're discussing these uh, economic issues, you know, that's something that's uh, maybe open to South Korea as well, too. I'm not saying that South Korea should uh, jump in and join the Quad, but that's one that is important for Korea as well. And of course, we have U.S., Japan, Korea uh, trilateralism. Uh, the U.S. is strengthening or building its uh, trilateral strategic partnerships. And despite the broken state of Korea-Japan bilateral relations, we've seen the U.S continuing to encourage, create space for uh, US, Japan, Korea trilaterals at various levels. And I'm not sure if anyone's keeping count, but uh, there's been at least a half dozen of these trilateral uh, working group uh, uh, meetings. So we've seen, we've also seen developments such as AUKUS, but I don't know how, if, if that's as, uh, as relevant to South Korea at the moment. But I do want to end with just one a broader comment about the regional architecture. And, and right now we're seeing um, this development of, of U.S.-centered, uh, U.S.-centered, you know, groupings, uh, coalitional groupings, and you know, uh, uh, former Secretary of Defense Ash Carter had talked about a, a principled security network, and I think this is what we're seeing uh, de developing out. And I'm curious if the U.S. is favoring this architecture over perhaps the ASEAN family of institutions, which has been the basis of multilateral cooperation in Asia since the post-Cold War period. And I think for South Korea, they've always felt more comfortable with uh, you know, the ASEAN-driven uh, you know, ASEAN uh, multilateralism because it includes uh, China um, and it tries to enmesh China. And, uh, and now if, you know, it's, if the US is uh, shifting towards uh, US, these more US-led coalitions and networks, trilaterals, the Quad, um, that might put uh, Korea in, in a more difficult position within the regional architecture. But uh, I think that's a broader question that we have to be, uh, we, we have to be following as these coalitional groupings unfold. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, perhaps I can go next to Professor Kim and offer your views. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so as we actually enter the Indo-Pacific you know, um, age, uh, I believe Korea is now uh, focusing on um, its focusing its effort on ASEAN countries, especially. Uh, you know, in the Asia Pacific uh, era, uh, age, South Korea maybe and Japan uh, were at the crossword between uh, Asia, uh, Asia and Pacific. But in uh, but in the Indo-Pacific um, uh, age, I believe ASEAN is rising as a core um, countries, and there is a growing. Um, <coughs> Uh, importance of uh, strategic role of India as blockade against the westward expansion of China. So this means that the center of global strategy actually will likely shift from um, Asia Pacific to uh, to South and and Southeast Asia. So I think it is no surprise that Northeast Asian countries such as Korea, Japan, and Taiwan 
are now emphasizing their southern policies. And now Korean government is pursuing a so-called new southern policy, uh, you know, to expand its interest in India and ASEAN countries. And I, I believe this may be uh, seen as a struggle or effort to, to seeking the survival strategy uh, amid increasing tension between the U.S. and China. Uh, we have talked about, you know, whether the South Korea should choose, you know, China or, or the U.S., you know, all the time today. Uh, but I think uh, this kind of policy uh, was chosen a as a way to avoid, you know, this question or pressure. So the policy goal is to raise uh, cooperation level, level of cooperation, uh, with India and ASEAN um, on par with four great powers such as U.S., China, and Russia, and Japan. Also, trade relations uh, will, you know, the large to reach uh, the size comparable to that of China. Uh, in short, I, I guess new southern policy aims to ease Korea's dependence on great powers, and in terms of politics, security, and economy. Uh, to diversifying, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, Korea's diplomatic uh, and economic options. Um, actually, the emphasis on ASEAN countries is uh, not entirely new uh, for Korea. Uh, past administration actually have come up with uh, many ambitious uh, strategy, but only to end up with um, a little uh, result. So the new southern policy also runs risk of, you know, repeating this uh, past mistake of emphasizing uh, short-term charitable or exhibitionist event. So I think the most important thing um, is to maintain the consistency, you know, uh, for a successful multilateral cooperation for the South Korea government at the moment. Great. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Professor Kim. Um, Alex Wong, when you were at the State Department before you um, took on the North Korea portfolio, you were working a lot on regional affairs. And so I was curious as to um, you know, your experience then, which groupings did you see as most important in their nascent phases? And what do you think of the situation now? And also, if I could ask you, um, nobody talks about APEC anymore. <laughs> do you have any thoughts on, any thoughts on that? Right. Um, <clears throat> Well, you're right. I, I did do the regional portfolio, including the Indo-Pacific strategy at state uh, for about six, seven months before doing North Korea. But it was an interesting six, seven months because it was the, still the early times in the Trump administration. And it was still uh, the early times, at least in the, the newly enunciated you know, new southern policy of, of, of South Korea. Uh, and in that, you know, I, I want to draft off of the prior statements from my colleagues. You know, I do think a, a joint focus uh, between South Korea and the United States on the ASEAN countries, not, not necessarily ASEAN qua ASEAN as the, you know, the, the, the multilateral grouping, but focusing on, on what commercial capacity building, trade connections we can both uh, work together on and leverage with particular Southeast Asian countries. I think that works all in, our, in, 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 in both of our, our countries' favor. You know, if you look at the, the ASEAN region, 650 million people, the uh, potential for GDP growth, population growth, trade growth over the next 10, 15, 20 years is immense uh, compared to other parts of, that are, you could say, are more economically mature throughout, throughout Asia. Uh, South Korea already has some very deep economic connections with a number of countries, Vietnam in particular, where if we working together, we can both leverage our, our relationships uh, in, in the region. And this is strategically in our interest. We want to embed those countries, again, in a web of commerce, in a free and open region, uh, to balance coercive measures and to cr keep those uh, countries uh, open to investment, keep those sea lines of communication open, because they are strategically placed. This is something we, both of our countries can work together on. And when I was in government, we were, at least I tried to begin doing that, and I think it has continued and does continue now in, in the Biden administration. Um, so that would be, I, I think, uh, uh, the focus now as to APEC, you're right. You know, it's it's it doesn't doesn't come up too much. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in my in my uh, my work in government, I didn't have too much interaction with APEC. It was kind of a separate economic uh, uh, grouping. Um, I will say that it is significant and continues to be significant for a number of reasons for, for the United States. And number one, because it is uh, one of the few fora where, where Taiwan participation is quite robust is, is accepted. Uh, and using that as an example of 
how Taiwan can contribute to other fora uh, continues to be a valuable piece of the effect. Not the only piece, of course, that's valuable, but one that I think particularly in this current environment is quite significant. Thanks, and of course, Korea played a critical role in uh, bringing Taiwan to, to APEC um, uh, back a couple of decades ago. Uh, Professor Kim hyun um, wonder if I could ask you the same question in terms of Korea's views of which of these multi, or where is the energy in terms of these multilateral initiatives uh, as, as Korea looks out at the region? And then if I could also ask you, um, the, what, I, what struck me about Dr. Campbell's remarks on the Quad was that he suggested there was a robust conversation taking place between the US and South Korea about the Quad. So I'd love to get your views on what you think Korea's position should be vis-a-vis -vis the Quad. So over to you. Uh, thank you for your question. Maybe, because I'm not a government person, maybe I, I don't know how the, the conversation about Quad is going on. Maybe I should have asked, uh, you know, Vice Minister Chair about that in the morning. Um, I think, uh, I, you know, Dr. Campbell mentioned about the, uh, you know, U.S. Alloki Summit meeting that happened in this May. And I think I agree, totally agree with him that this has been a very important critical juncture for the alliance. I mean, um, you know, U.S.-South Korea alliance has been transformed after the end of Cold War in 2008, which was very late very late post-Cold War transformation. At the time, it was transformed into comprehensive strategic alliance, but uh, I mean, the regional uh, level cooperation was very dormant because uh, you know, South Korea had, had to think about uh, the China issues all the time. Uh, the regional stability and peace issue has been always a burden for South Korea. Um, and I think this May, uh, you know, some meeting has changed a, the alliance you know, completely. I, I'm not sure what's gonna happen, whether this critical juncture will continue in the future or not. But, but for so long time, the US-South Korea uh, you know, common threat perception was totally disturbed. I think it was uh, distorted. Uh, recently, uh, I don't think you know, you know, current government is trying to see North Korea as a threat anymore, uh, which I think uh, you know, so, you know, the US is still trying to see uh, North Korea as a threat, even though it wants to look at it as a partner to be engaged with. Um, China issues, the U.S. wants to use the U.S. Solar Alliance to deal with China, which I think is still has been a burden for South Korea. But I think um, uh, this May summit meeting has commonized many things between two countries. Uh, we agreed upon how to deal with North Korea issues, uh, engaging North Korea. And most importantly, uh, Dr. Campbell mentioned it right, uh, you know, important issues like climate change and health and uh, new technology issues. We have agreed upon our, you know, cooperation on the, you know, global supply chain issues. And what is more important is that I think um, um, current Biden government in the Pacific strategy, one of the characteristics of that policy is the very flexible issue-based cooperations and formation of minilateralism. Um, it began, these three uh, agenda setting, climate change, health, and, and new technology, began at the Quad meeting, uh, Quad summit meeting early this year, and then it has been agreed at the US-Japan summit meeting, next at the US-South Korea summit meeting, and also G7 meeting. So the, all the uh, you know, agendas and issues, the same agenda setting and, and their agreement upon bolstering the global supply chain on those uh, issues has been an uh, ongoing issue, I think. It's not the one, the one that has been only agreed at the uh, US-South Korea summit, but I, th I think uh, throughout this summit agreement, I think uh, South Korea is completely uh, participating in the Indo-Pacific strategy. Great, thank you. Um, Andrew, if I could go to you, uh, just focusing on the quad for this round, I mean, could you give us your views on uh, Korea's position vis-a-vis -vis the quad? You know, the, the, Korea seems to be trying to operate in parallel to the quad, um, mm -hmm. producing basically the same deliverables, but in a U.S. ROK bilateral context. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether those two should be merged. Right. I mean, that's what Dr. Kim was saying, that we have these different agendas that you can you know, break out into different mini laterals at summit meetings or at forums, you know, like the G20 or 
know, even at, at COP26. And that enables South Korea to engage with the United States and other like-minded partners uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. But I mean, that's, that's a key question, whether South Korea, though, should move, n- not in parallel, but with uh, move closer into the quad or become part of, uh, we may perhaps in the quad plus, but be- become join within some configuration of this quad rather than moving uh, moving in parallel. And I, I mean, I think we're really going to have to wait until the next, uh, until the Korean elections to know whether we'll move closer in that direction or not, depending on uh, who, who takes the blue house. But uh, I mean, in my mind, it seems that Korea is, I mean, there, there are other questions. It's not just what Korea or the United States wants, but it's other, the other members of Quad. How welcoming would Japan be if, if Korea, you know, wants to, or you know, joins, signs up for the Quad? Or, you know, how, what would India's reaction be? Um, so, you know, it's, so, so it's not clear whether the Quad is the answer for South, South Korea. I think more important is making sure that they're staying engaged with the Indo-Pacific. And, as I mentioned, we've seen a shift in the Biden administration leaning on the Quad and other hub and spoke based coalitions and strategic partnerships. And, you know, what, in addition to the Quad, you know, I really think we should be, the South Korea should be looking at this US Japan Korea trilateral um, relationship more seriously. And, and Korea, you know, may feel that's behind the curve. Because um, even, even with the Quad, you have other trilaterals US Japan, Australia, US Japan, India. Um, but this is the one, this is the one place where I think Korea can make the most significant contribution. Uh, but that means finding a way to work together with Japan. So it's one of the goals towards which the new Kishida government, uh, and the next government Seoul should, uh, you know, they should also uh, move forward towards. Thanks, Andrew. I I will get to the question of Japan, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I want to, let's finish this round on the quad first and then perhaps, um, I'll, I'll have, um, Alex, start on the U.S., Japan, Korea trial. But Professor Kim, could you give us your views on the on, on South Korea and with regard to the Quad? Okay, so uh, let me give. I mean, I like to say a few words about whether or not South Korea should join the Quad because this is the, the most important uh, issue in Korea regarding uh, Quad. Um, actually, uh, I think it is. Um, uh, matter of whether South Korea should, uh, can maintain this strategic ambiguity between uh, the U.S. and China. Um, so for uh, for now, South Korean government position, official position, is that while it agrees with proposal of Quad, uh, it cannot officially uh, participate in, in Quad because participating in Quad, as we know, all know, that maybe uh, cause some conflict with uh, China. So since uh, South Korea consider both sides, uh, China and U.S., I think South Korea, Korea uh, should be only cautious. But uh, personally, I believe that attending Quad or not, or Quad Plus membership, shouldn't be uh, the major question, you know, for South Korea. Uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Yeo mentioned, uh, one can even question whether uh, quad member countries, especially Japan, <laughs> are willing to open the door for um, South Korea, which has been displaying um, this, you know, the passive attitude toward um, quad. And also, there is the issue of South Korea Japan uh, relations. Uh, you know, so for example, Japanese Prime Minister uh, Kishida's first order of business when he came to the office last month uh, to have phone call with uh, Quad members, you know, the United States and Australia and India. And then he went on to the UK and China and Russia. Then, <laughs> you know, Japanese media commented on this. Um, actually, this means that Korea has been, uh, been relegated to the second tier of Japanese uh, diplomacy. So now I think the key strategic question should be how welcome uh, will Quad members be toward South Korea and which issue and field uh, would they welcome South Korea and what kind of contribution uh, can South Korea make in, in enhancing Quad's you know, uh, capability in resolving um, the issue, major problems confronting um, the region. And we, we know that you know, there are signs that uh, Quad evolved into more of uh, industrial infrastructure gathering uh, alliance rather than uh, full brown uh, military alliance. So in that sense, I think Korea can make some contribution, uh, maybe 
uh, in the field of high capability, uh, technical ca uh, capacity uh, in supply chain resilience or uh, medical and healthcare and data access and transmission and, and, and so forth. So the focus on quad actually should shift from uh, collective actions, uh, shift toward actually collective action to solve more urgent problem in the region uh, rather than, you know, rather than focusing on whether South Korea should join the court, you know, uh, this join uh, free the court or not. So right. that's my thank, opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very thoughtful comments. Alex, um, I'd love your view on the quad as well, but also to, to take us into the next and final round of questions, uh, of course, Japan and the trilateral <coughs> relationship. It seems that, I mean, at least from a U.S. perspective, what we see is you know, there's a lot of uh, multilateral activity um, involving Japan, whether it's in the Quad or the Trilateral Development Alliance with Australia or the strategic TSD, Trilateral Strategic Dialogue. There's a lot of multilateral networking of the alliance system with Japan. And then now we're starting to see more on the Korea side with US Korea Australia, US Korea ASEAN, but there's nothing <laughs> connecting these two. Of course, the United States is connecting these two, but of course, you know, the big issue uh, is uh, Korea-Japan relations. So I'd love your views on both those things, both on the quad and then also what we can do to, um, about, the, about the bilateral relationship between Seoul and Tokyo and the broader trilateral. Right. Just, just a short thing on the quad first since to continue the conversation. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm a, a little nervous about uh, going too quick and too broad in uh, you know, framing certain cooperative, you know, relationships in terms of the quad, uh, only because, you know, we're, we're very still quite early in the quad concept. Mm. And it's only really recently that uh, the quad has really picked up momentum at the leader level, mainly because India is interested in, in the recent, you know, one or two years. And that's always the, um, the question mark in my mind, is that we can keep India focused on being a, 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 a forthright participant in the Quad. Um, you know, India is, is, is you know, any, any grouping, any, any coalition, any, any framework is only as strong as its weakest link. And I, my, the question in my mind is, will India be, be interested for the long term? They have a history of being non-aligned. They have a very small diplomatic core that just from a, a, a manpower capacity standpoint makes it hard for them to participate and contribute in these types of frameworks. So that is a big question in my mind that, you know, when there is not a big threat from the north or when there's not a particular reason why they're, they're interested now, will they continue to be interested? So concentrating on the quad as the quad before you know, branching that would be my, my general approach. <clears throat> as far as trilateral cooperation, the trilateral relationship between Korea and Japan, you know, just stepping back, I think we're all in agreement when we look at this, when we look at that trilateral grouping, it should make complete sense to all parties involved. We have the same geographic threats and interests. We have the same commercial interests in Northeast Asia. We have uh, you know, a shared uh, uh, systems and culture of democracy. But clearly, as you all know, there's always in continuing, the continuing salience of historical issues between, between Japan and Korea. So what should really be for the United States a force multiplier of our strategy and a way to save uh, diplomatic resources and be efficient among all the players actually becomes a drain on our political capital, our diplomatic capital. Every time there is a, an uptick in, in Japan-Korea relations where the United States, um, you know, for better or for worse, has to play a mediator role, a convener role, a facilitator role. And, and that takes up resources, that doesn't save resources. So, you know, instead of, you know, creating these parallel cooperative frameworks that you've mapped out, Victor, I think, uh, you know, focus of, of each administration, and I'm not sure how much of, it's, of it is a focus now of the current one, I'm not involved in those discussions, but the watchword for me would be institutionalization. That if we're going to, if the United States is going to play a facilitator role, a go-between role on any topic, whether it's intelligence sharing, military exercises, discussions of extended de deterrence and missile defense, you can throw a lot of things in the basket. Those shouldn't just be facilitating talks now, but conceptualizing institutional frameworks that can insulate trilateral cooperation from the inevitable flare-ups in the historical tensions between 
Japan and Korea, insulate them, protect them, and then in the long run, save the political and diplomatic capital that we, we always spend in order to keep the trilateral grouping in a, in a good place. Thanks, Alex. Um, Professor Kim, you and I in the past have been part of different track 1.5s and track 2s on trying to improve US-Japan Korea trilateralism. Um, I want to ask you um, first, I mean, your personal thoughts on that, first of all. And then second, um, one of the reasons that Foreign Minister, uh, Vice Foreign Minister Che jong gun was here on this trip is to participate in bilaterals and trilaterals with uh, the United States and Japan, part of the quarterly deputy secretary, deputy foreign minister, vice foreign minister level um, talks when Alex talks about institutionalization, right? This may be one of the ways to institutionalize this. So my, my first question is your personal thoughts. My second question is, do you think that this effort to institutionalize the trilateral relationship among the allies will continue, you know, whichever government comes into power in Korea after the election in March? Um, I didn't really uh, have a good sense about uh, which candidate's policies about U.S., uh, South Korea, Japan, trilateralism. Uh, but I think it seems like, uh, you know, still a uh, conservative candidate has more tendency to, to restore the relationship between Japan and Korea, it seems like. Um, personally, I think for now, U.S., Japan, Korea relationship uh, is in jeopardy, but I think it's getting better because there was a uh, very delicate role played by the United States. Of course, the historical issue has not been solved. Um, and uh, the track to approach to, to link Japan and Korea, uh, I don't think is very well working right now. Um, uh, you know, historical issues still there um, and, and, and trying to uh, form a trilateral cooperation uh, is not working very well because um, maybe the South Korean government suddenly changed its attitude to be uh, very favorable to Japan, but Japanese government is still very anti-South Korea. Uh, maybe domestic politics works. Uh, that's what uh, appeals to the Japanese public, but I don't know. But um, So I think institutionalizing I think, would be very important um, to revive, to revive these kinds of uh, uh, trilateralism. Um, uh, you know, for now it seems like uh, North Korea issues, they have uh, common, uh, commonality about complete denuclearization. Uh, but it seems like uh, Jap Japan emphasizes deterrence more, and South Korea emphasizes North-South Korea rapprochement more. And it seems like the U.S. is, uh, you know, focusing on the management of North Korean issues. But I think, uh, you know, North Korea issue is fine. Um, the other issue I think uh, should be how the trilateralism evolves into the future. Uh, you know, Dr. Campbell mentioned that we are pretty in good shape to cooperate on uh, important global uh, cooperations like health and climate change and new technologies. But uh, what if it evolves into military cooperation, for example? Uh, before we tried um, uh, TISA is there and Gisomia is there, and we tried to evolve into uh, um, you know, AXA, which is uh, Acquisition Cross Service Agreement, mm -hmm. uh, to make it more solid uh, trilateralism. Um, and, and, and would that be possible in the future? And, and, and in, order, in order to achieve that kind of military trilateral cooperation, uh, South Korea, I think, has to deal with China about three nodes that has been uh, some sort of promise between two countries. So those kind of things might be huddled. Uh, but I think for now, institutionalization is uh, something that is very important to, to restore the trilateralism that has been the case before the historical you know, trouble between two countries. So I think we've heard, Andrew, we've heard from both uh, Alex and Hyunook about the importance of institutionalization in the Japan-Korea-U.S. relationship. Um, but I guess my question to you is, um, as also has been suggested, politics is also important in terms of outcomes in this three-way relationship. And I guess my question to you is, you know, we do have a new government in Japan. Um, um, 
and even though Kishida went every place else before he went to Korea, uh, we do have a new government in Japan. Kishida was the foreign minister when the 2015 agreement was reached. And of course, we'll have a new government in Korea, uh, in uh, uh, an election in March, and a new government in Korea in May. So do you think that particular constellation of political forces uh, prevent, presents an opportunity or an obstacle to um, improvement in the trilateral relationship? Yes, Victor, as you know very well, you know, I, we always say that the constellations have to align between domestic and international politics in both, in both Japan and Korea. And you know, these are opportunities, uh, political opportunities to um, revamp uh, bilateral relations between Korea and Japan. So for Kishida and, and the LDP, you know, there's some modicum of stability now. So uh, I think they may have uh, a little more uh, diplomatic capital to spend uh, on uh, an improving relations with Korea. And, and for South Korea as well, too, as we've heard, I think public opinion uh, in Korea towards Japan has been increasing in part because of uh, because of uh, the intensification of U.S.-China uh, rivalry and just uh, Chinese assertiveness in the region, so so things are shifting. And um, and I, I and as we as we run up to the South Korea election, and regardless of who comes to the Blue House, I, I do think that um, both the conservative and the uh, and the progressive candidates should try to capitalize on on the shift in domestic public opinion. Now, as uh, Dr. Uh, Kim uh, Hanuk mentioned. Uh, the conservative uh, parties, the conservative candidates tend to be more uh, more prone to you know, trying to uh, mend uh, mend the fence with with Japan. But you know, regardless of which candidate comes to power, I think it's 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 crucial to improve the relationship with uh, uh, with between uh, Korea and Japan. And I, I do want to mention that what's interesting about the U.S. Japan Korea tri trilateral is that it's probably the one trilateral that tends to focus very specifically on Northeast Asia. The other trilaterals that the United States have is, is, is broader because you have Australia, you have India. Um, you're, these are really configured to address issues within the Indo-Pacific. But for this trilateral, it's really focused on Northeast Asia and North Korea. Moving forward in terms of institutionalization, um, you know, there, there may have to be more conversations about how the U.S.-Japan-Korea uh, trilateral relationship also addresses a, a broader you know, issues, whether it's contingencies on on the Taiwan Straits or you know, so, you know some other issue. And I I do think that uh, those uh, those more difficult issues will eventually have to be uh, have to be broached. Yes, thank thanks, Andrew um, and Professor Kim. I'd like to go to you, Professor Kim Ji Young. The um, it's interesting what Andrew says because. We think about U.S., Japan, Korea trilateral. Uh, we think about it in terms of North Korea. Um, and then we also think about it in a broader global context, providing public goods, whether it's development assistance. These seem like areas ripe for cooperation. But there's the, the regional element, particularly with regard to China. I think that's quite sensitive for, for, for South Korea, probably less so for Japan, but more so for South Korea. So, you know, I, I guess I was curious as to your views on um, the extent to which this trilateral relationship um, um, can can uh, 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 can focus on questions like the Taiwan Straits or 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 or, or, or maritime security or these sorts of things that that um, uh, are important to both to all three countries. Yeah, actually, um, China issue <laughs> is very complicated to, you know, discuss whether you know we always talk about whether the South Korea have to uh, to choose um, China or the U.S. That has been the important question. But I think as a uh, Japan expert, I like to pay more attention to Japan South Korea actually the relations you know, in terms of this uh, improving U.S. Japan and South Korea. Uh, um, Cooperation, uh, as you know, we all know the the uh, the weakest link uh, in triangular alliance has always been the relationship between China and uh, I mean uh, the Korea and Japan, and we are currently actually experiencing the the you know the worst situation on that front in recent years, as you know history problems spread it into uh, economy and security, um, you know as 
Mr. Campbell uh, mentioned before, the worsening of Japan and South Korea relations is not uh, in, in U.S. interest. Uh, and I believe nor in um, the Japan and South Korea interest. Um, but the United States actually historically uh, imposed the pressure um, to reduce tension between the two countries. Uh, well, and then I believe we'll continue to, to do so in the future. Uh, but unfortunately, I think recent years we have witnessed the limit of this pressure. Um, and because it has been uh, only temporarily uh, pain and labor. So now uh, I think that Korea and Japan at the point where uh, they have to be more proactive uh, uh, toward resolving the problem. Um, so, you know, um, I have a bit different opinion from uh, Dr. Yeo, you know, the, for, uh, with this new Prime Minister Kishida. Um, the situation is not that easy. Uh, because Kishida is, as you mentioned, um, uh, Kishida actually considered a dwarf in South Korea-Japan uh, relations. Uh, but as uh, you know, Dr. Cha mentioned, he led the Kampo Women Agreement in 1915 uh, as Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. And also he was elected as Prime Minister with the uh, support from uh, LDP hardliners. So he stated that Korea is the one who breached the promise. And also, Korea should so Korea should come up with um, the solution. Uh, moreover, uh, I, I believe Kishida will uh, likely to focus more on U.S.-Japan relations than than improving South Korea relations, South Korea-Japan relations um, relations. So, uh, you know, many scholars uh, actually have suggested that we have take like two track, so-called two track approach. Um, in which you know history problem should be separated from uh, other uh, important issues like economy and uh, security. But now I think uh, it's time to reconsider uh, that method. Actually, uh, and then we have to take one you know one track approach. In that you know we should actually prioritize history problem, and then uh, we deal with other issues along with uh, history problem. So I think. Um, now it's really time to, to um, the South Korean government and Japanese government get together and you know, think about taking this package approach in which you know, um, the two governments discuss about the, the resolution of history problem, including Kampo Woman uh, issue and also South Korean uh, Supreme Court decision on forced labor, uh, along with you know, Japan's uh, withdrawal from export control and also normalization of GSOMIA. Uh, and I think this is the only, um, not only, but um, how can I say, uh, the very um, practical way to uh, actually strengthening the Japan, South Korea, and US uh, relations, a triangular cooperation at the moment. I'm sorry, I don't think I can you know, answer to your question about China, but um, I think this is the most important thing to strengthening um, the relationship uh, between these three countries, so that's why, yeah. Great, thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you very much for, the, uh, for those comments. Um, I, you know, I wish we had more time for discussion, but uh, unfortunately, uh, we, are, we are at the end of this session, so please join me in thanking our panelists for a very interesting discussion. And uh, thank you to our audience online as well for watching. I'm sorry we couldn't take your questions. Um, <clears throat> at this point in the program, I'd like to turn the floor uh, over to President Lee Gun of the Korea Foundation to offer some final reflecting thoughts. Uh, do we do we impress our lead, President Lee to come to the stage? And we can ask our panelists to depart. How about that? Okay. And presently, why don't you come up here to the stage? Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Why don't you come and join us up here? Very good. Okay. Please. Please. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Cha. Uh, this morning and afternoon, uh, we uh, touched upon a variety of issues uh, such as North Korea, China, Japan, uh, Korea-U.S. Summit, uh, Quad, uh, AUKUS, 
global issues from climate change to 5G, 6G technologies uh, and vaccine diplomacy. Um, as we all know, this forum, forum is not aiming at reaching a consensus among all the participants within just one day. Uh, but uh, this forum is more about exchanging different ideas and learning from uh, each other. Uh, there may be many takeaways uh, from today's long discussions of many different issues. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, the most precious lesson that I learned uh, from today's discussion is the role of and importance of values in international relations. Uh, particularly the universal human values such as human rights, democracy, and freedom. Uh, we talked about uh, interests as well, uh, and of course interests are uh, one, of the one of the most important drivers of international politics, but the problem with interest is that uh, we cannot predict where we are heading if we focus solely on interests. Uh, the direction could be democratic, uh, it could be authoritarian, or even fascist. Uh, the direction could be subservient, or dependent, or hegemonic. But on the other hand, if we focus on values, we know where we want to go. Uh, we want to go to democratic directions. We want to make our country more uh, human rights conscious. Uh, we also value freedom. And uh, we also want to uh, lead our country into the liberal and democratic direction. So um, now when we ask ourselves what kind of countries and world we want to pass on to our children and the next generation, uh, I do think that the values will be certainly uh, the most important navigator uh, to answer the question. And on that note, uh, I would like to thank all participants and uh, panelists for their insightful discussion today. And I also would like to thank uh, Professor Victor Cha uh, for his leadership for this forum. And my special thanks also uh, go to the CSIS and the Korea Foundation staff who have worked tirelessly to ensure uh, that this forum could take place safely in the, t in the time of COVID-19. Uh, we look forward to holding this forum again next year and hope we will be able to invite the audience in this conference room. Thank you very much.